Right, I want to talk about a very, very niche, little-known console called the Amstrad GX4000. Now, I know that around about 50% of the people that have, that have watched my videos come from the US. Um, none of you will have heard of this console. Um, the other... The other 50% of my view of, of people who viewed videos on my channel come from uh, Europe. 90% uh, of that 50% also won't have heard of this console. So why am I talking about it? Well, basically, um, because not because not not many people know about it now. I know this is supposed to be about the, the sort of uh, the bigger consoles of the third generation, like the stuff that matters, but I'm going to make a special case for this console, um, purely because although it doesn't really matter, I mean, it, it wasn't groundbreaking by any means, um, it was a British console, and it's... It, it, it's purely down to the fact that nobody knows what it is. It's, it's, it may be interesting, it may not. I mean, judge it for yourself. Um, and I'm still going to give my verdict at the end, although, uh, to be fair, I am pretty sure. Uh, you know, so, some of the videos where I've done this, I'm not entirely certain what the verdict's going to be until I sort of go through it all. Uh, this one, I'm pretty sure <laughs> I'm pretty sure what the verdict is going to be, to be fair. Um... Anyway, so, Amstrad GX4000. First of all, a little bit on Amstrad. Now, if, you've, if you know Amstrad nowadays, um, what you will, basically, the things they're known for is, um, if you're a home consumer and you have satellite television, it's likely, or it's... 50% um, likely that Amstrad are the people that make your uh, satellite television box. So you'll know them for that. Uh, if you're a commercial advertiser, uh, then it may be that a subsidiary of Amstrad has sold you uh, billboard, uh, electronic billboard advertising space, uh, because they do that as well now. Um, Although most people uh, will actually know them from for the head of Amstrad, Sir Alan Sugar, or Lord Alan Sugar, I think. I'm not sure which one he is. I'm pretty sure he's Lord Alan, actually, um, who I'll put a photo of up there. Um, and he is basically, for the Americans that don't know who he is, or for anyone else who doesn't know who he is, uh, he is most famous at the moment for having a show called The Apprentice now, um, which is quite topical because, you know, in the US, Donald Trump had a show called The Apprentice, and if you've seen that, it's almost exactly the same, only, you know, a cheaper version of that. Um, so effectively, Alan Sugar is the British Donald Trump, although I don't know if he'd see it that way. Um, you know, Prime Minister Alan... 2020. Anyway, so that's Amstrad as a company. They don't really, they're not, they're not the, the force in British industry that they once were. Um, I could probably, I've said in a previous video, I could do, I could probably do an entire video on Atari. I could do five videos on Amstrad, to be fair. Um, anyway, in the 80s, they were known for computers. And uh, in the mid-80s, they did, in fact, buy uh, Sinclair from Clive Sinclair. That, that basically became an Amstrad company. Um, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, because of their background in computing and... Uh, Alan Sugar's uh, Alan Sugar had a, had a thing about computers at the time, and and he, he it, arguably he was very very successful. I mean, he may not have set the world on fire with the you know by trying to corner the PCs market, but he did very well in Britain. It can't really be argued that Amstrad did actually do very well in Britain in, in the PC market. So that's why um, in 1990 they decided to release a console. Uh, called the Amstrad GX4000. 
Now, the reason why the Amstrad PCs were quite good is because they were basically cut down IBMs. Um, at the same time that IBM was selling a machine that was £1,200, Amstrad would sell you one that was £590, £650 or so. Um, and they, were based, uh, they weren't full PCs, they were glorified word processors at best. Um, but the point was they were cheap. And um, obviously, they, I mean, this philosophy works well for office machines. Um, you know, the whole... Uh, buy for one pound, sell for two pound sort of scenario that, that Amstrad had then. Uh, I mean, everything was made off in Far East factories from reasonably cheap components. Um, everything, most, most of the things in them were all stock components. There was nothing that was unique to them machines whatsoever. Uh, so they decided they were going to get into the console market. So, 1990, they released the Amstrad GX4000 with the same philosophy that they had with the PCs. Um, so again, all really cheap components uh, stuck in a fancy case, basically. Um, now, they were released in Britain and France, um, although, proviso on this, uh, Wikipedia tells me that they were released in Spain and Italy as well. But as I've said in previous videos, unless I can back up the sources, I can't. Um, I'm, I'm not going to confirm that. I've got. I can find nothing else that confirms that they were sold in Spain and Italy. Uh, although I do know that Amstrad at that time did have quite a large uh, Spanish division uh, to push to push forward on the the marketing of their uh, of their word processors in Spain at the time so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that they were definitely released in Spain although like I say I can't find any evidence to back that up I can't find um, any any games in Spanish I can't find manuals in Spanish nothing like that uh, Britain and France they were definitely released um, because quite often the ones you'll see on eBay are the French machines because uh, France, ironically enough for a British company, France did, did actually get a much wider release of this console than Britain did. Um, so yeah, they were £100 when they came out in 1990. So that tells you, basically, if, if, Amaz if, if, Amazon, if Amstrad are putting a product to marketplace for a hundred pounds that tells me there is about 20 pounds worth of components in this machine at the time so that's 1990s 20 pounds so that's the equivalent today of building a machine um for say 60 pounds um it, uh, you know, it, it, it's the equivalent of building a machine for sixty pounds, say, and trying to sell it alongside a PlayStation Four. It's not going to work. Um, so this is the problem. I mean, it, working with PCs, this this budgeting budget system idea worked very well with consoles, not so much. And and this is uh, this is going to illustrate how th this this console actually went. Um, now. So yeah, it was released at a price point of £100 at the time, um, and it very rapidly disappeared to about £30 uh, within six months, um, or six to eight months of the system coming out. It was in bargain bins for £30. It did not sell well. But bearing in mind the, the console landscape at the time, this was released a couple of weeks, I think, before the Mega Drive was. Um, so... And you've got to remember at the time, people, when, when you get towards the end of the third generation, consumers were a lot more informed um, on what was going on, on, on what things were and what was coming out and, and you know, the, the technical specifications of that. Because basically, the newspapers and magazines and things like that had all caught up with what was going on. Um, so everyone, you could, if you were into, uh, say, Nintendo, you could go and buy uh, 
you know, any, any number of half a dozen different Nintendo magazines off the shelf. You could go, if you were in uh, the, the Master System, you could, again, you could go and buy another half a dozen Master System publications. If you were generally into sort of video games, you could, you could go and buy, you know, maybe a dozen different, uh, like CMVG or Games Master or something like that and just, just buy it off the, well, Games Master, I don't think it started printing a magazine by that point. Um, but you get what I'm saying. People were far more informed, they knew what was going on, and had had this all happened before that sort of uh, consumer information time, uh, they could have probably get, got away with this and probably sold a lot more, but people knew on, on the face of what was coming over the horizon, people knew this console was doomed even then, um, and in fact I think even Dixon's was one of the first stores uh, reportedly to start dropping the price and they did it within two months of the console coming out not not to you know 25 30 quid but it started dropping within you know months of this thing hitting the shelves so clearly there was no confidence in this console from the get-go um, you know and, and quite rightly so considering the specifications of the thing um, there was a much more popular machine called the Amstrad CPC which was basically, um, which this 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 console is sort of based on, um, which was it, it was um, tape tape games basically. It was it was like a glorified well, it, it was effectively a Spectrum Plus two, um, and a lot of the games that ended up on the GX four thousand were ports of games from the CPC. Uh, not that that's a particularly bad thing, but bearing in mind that a CPC at the time. Uh, would have only cost you 50 quid and the games were on tape so they were far cheaper as well as opposed to this system which was a cartridge system um, and that was the other problem or one of the one of the other problems was um, the production uh, not only by the fact that there was less than 30 games produced uh, some places will say there was there was 20 and some places will say there was anything up to 27 maybe 30 um, although there's at least two of them that nobody's actually ever seen a physical cartridge of uh, you know um, but they had massive production costs in actually getting these things built because there was a chip shortage um, and even though they they, they were produced um, in quite small numbers and to such a small cost, um, they were, everything, nothing was proprietary, everything was stock chips, uh, there was still a problem actually getting these things, these cartridges produced and on the market. Uh, whereas like I say, had it been a tape machine like the CPC, there wouldn't have been that issue, that it was no problem. Um, to my mind, Amstrad should have just done an updated CPC, but by the by. Um, yeah, so they were, they were stuck with production problems with the cartridges, so they had no, they had very little product to actually get on the shelves. Um, they were built cheaply and this is the other problem as well. Cartridges, even cheaply built cartridges at that time, were still far more expensive for consumers to buy than even um, the, uh, the like the CPC boxed versions of tapes. You know, you you could walk in and buy a copy of, uh, say, oh, I don't know. Oh, let me think. I mean, you could you could walk in and buy a game, basically for a CPC on tape. Uh, for about five six pounds, or you could buy the GX four thousand version of the same game, a direct port from the tape, albeit with slightly maybe updated graphics. A Batman's a good example because it did have a few updates to the graphics, um, but it was twenty five quid. So imagine you're a 12 year old boy walking in there with his parents and maybe you've got a CPC as well maybe you've got the maybe you you fancy getting a GX4000 and mum and dad go well that isn't that the same game as that and that one's five pounds and that one's 25 pounds no you you stick with the CPC son don't you worry we'll get you a few games instead 
I mean, it just it. Not only were they were they trying to bring this console out um, to compete with with other manufacturers, they were directly competing with their own equipment, with their own machines. It's just it it. It is utter madness. It is absolute utter madness. Um, so anyway, that, I mean, there was there was lots and lots of problems, and there's a, there's another issue with a that I'm going to explain in a bit with uh, the cheapness of cartridges. Now, for all its faults, the actual design of this console, apart from the internals, I mean, uh, I mean the externals, it it was. There was just things put in there that you just didn't see. I mean, it had a full SCART block on the back, like a full RGB SCART connector, the full the full length one, which you just you never. See. I don't. I can't even think of another console that has that. I mean, a lot of them have proprietary connections that go into a SCART lead at one end, but this was an actual. SCART lead, like you would have on the back of a video recorder or, or, or you know, a cable box or something like that. I mean, I, don't, I can't even think of another console that's ever done that. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I honestly can't think of one. Um, but then, I mean, uh, with hindsight, you, you, you'd argue perhaps, mm, was it worth doing? Uh, probably not, but it, it, you know, nonetheless, it was it was there. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, uh, oh, analog joystick port as well, um, which was a good idea. And also, there's a a little socket on the front of the console that many many people seem to think is some sort of network port because it looks like a um, RJ11 connect. No, is it an RJ11 or RJ45? RJ45 connector. Uh, that a telephone would plug into, but it's a, it's actually not a network port. That was for uh, the light gun, believe it or not. Um, and I, I assume that Amstrad were intending at some point to release a light gun. Um, as far as I know, they never got round to it, but there are one or two third-party companies that did, uh, even though there's only two or three compatible games for it. But the, the there's a little network... Uh, a little... Uh, socket on the front for an RJ45 connector that a lot of people think is for networking um, and I have heard people say because doing a little bit of research because like I say I do do the research um, lots of people seem to be under the impression that this is some sort of network uh, cable it's not it's for the light gun that doesn't exist or does exist, but not made by Amstrad. It was there was a third party one, or maybe two third party ones. Um, and if I can find pictures of them, I will put them up here. But as of doing the research for this video, I can't find any. It's only because I happen to know that that's the light gun socket that it, I'm telling you that. Um, so yeah, I mean, back to the console itself. It is on the dawn of the 16-bit console universe this was an 8-bit machine it just absolutely died and it's not it's not necessarily down to, well, it's a bit it's quite a lot down to the hardware but it's also quite a lot down to the marketing um, I think the, the final figures released for marketing this machine and bearing in mind this is European wide marketing figures not just in the UK this is what Amstrad actually spent on the marketing budget for this machine was less than two million pounds. Um, now, I mean, personally, if I had two million pounds, I could think of a lot better things to do with it than market a machine. But even in 1990, you've got to understand that if your, your European-wide marketing budget for an entire machine and its line of games is two million pounds, I mean, that that even shows you that Amstrad didn't have that much faith in this console on its own, because that is nothing. I mean, I, nin Nintendo and Sega probably spent that in, in a month's worth. In fact, probably spent more than that in a month's worth of marketing during the 90s. Um, this was the entire marketing budget that Amstrad spent in, in the whole... Uh, 10 months, I think, that this console was around for the entirety of Europe. 
um, was less than two million pounds. Now that is amazing how little marketing money that is. Um, so this, I mean, this is part of the reason why nobody's ever heard of it and there was no international, uh, no uh, uh, intercontinental releases of this console. Great. So, problems with actually collecting for this system, should you wish to do so. Uh, if you live anywhere but in the UK or continental Europe, you will need to have a uh, voltage stepper in order to use one because as again as it was never released in anywhere other than the UK and Europe um, there are no power supplies available that will power it that were released in anywhere anywhere else so if you live in the US and you do want to get one of these although I can't imagine why um, then you will have to have you will have to find your own solution of, of, of stepping the voltage down to 240 240 volts to run a UK power supply, for example. Um, the again, you you would have to um, you would have to import one, which again is very expensive. But to the people that live in the UK, the machines are hard to find. They they are what I would call hard to find. Um, if you want a French one then that's fine, uh, but do bear in mind it will come with a French power supply which again you will have to find some sort of adapter in order to work. Uh, they're not impossible to find the machines, you can find them although don't pay an awful lot of money for them, especially as most of the ones you will find have no games bundled with them, so you will not have the possibility, I mean most people even selling them, uh, I've said this before, like if, if people have the ability to test something and it is sold as untested, consider it broken. Uh, anywhere you find these for sale, consider them broken, uh, because not all of them even left the, fr the factories in working condition, uh, so do bear that in mind, even if it's in a sealed box. Um, there is no guarantee that it is working. So do bear that in mind. Um, again, this, this comes down to basically the cheapness of the hardware that was inside the console. I mean, it was, it was a budget system that was built to a budget. It was designed to be a budget system from the get-go, like a lot of Amstrad machines at the time. Only, like I say, what works for PCs is not necessarily going to work for consoles. Um, and in fact, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to leave the machine now and and go on to the cartridges because th this is the other thing. Um the cartridges are I don't think I've known any systems cartridges so utterly cheaply made and utterly devoid of personality. If you ever see one of these cartridges, which is again is rare, I mean the cartridges are like rocking or shit, they really are. You, you can find the systems on occasion, um, but finding the cartridges and finding boxed ones, Christ, uh, you, you're lucky if you see two of them in, in one lifetime, you really are, um, unless you have actually gone vastly out of your way to find these things. Um, they come in these giant sort of boxes that look a lot like, they're sort of grey soulless video box cases with a sticker on them. I mean they really are so cheap, uh, such an afterthought and so devoid of any personality to do with the console. I mean a lot of people have a go at Master System game boxes for instance, but at least them things look like somebody's put 10 minutes worth of effort into them, even if it is a silly drawing on some square paper. I mean, the the boxes that these Amstrad uh, 4000 games come in, they're honestly a like a short grey video cassette box with a, with a wraparound sticker on them. They really are an afterthought. So, even if you do collect them, it's not going to look nice on your shelf. It, it's just it's going to look so... it's just nothing. Um, so, right, 
the other problem is now I don't know if anyone if any if this is going to chime a chord with anyone but when I was in the early 90s I was just so I was finishing junior school and moving on to secondary school and I remember being this there was this rumor that went around the playground um, I think it was about Mega Drive cartridges at the time there were certain Mega Drive cartridges that something was wrong with the internals of the cartridge um, and if you put it into your Mega Drive system it, it basically bricked it, it killed the console and that was it, you couldn't use that console ever again and these were called killer cartridges and there was rumours, I, I think it was probably one of the magazines that, that started this in one of their letters page or somebody wrote into a letters page on a magazine and it, these rumours started to spread and I remember that it, it, was, it was somebody said that there was a golden axe cartridge out there with, that had a particular sticker on the box or something like that there was there was a sonic one cartridge that did it there was there was uh, uh, I mean there was rumors about all these different games that supposedly had killer cartridge variants even then um, that when you put them in your console that killed them turns out that with the Amstrad this is true um, there are killer cartridges and that's not down to they weren't obviously specifically designed that way but some of the hardware inside the cartridge, because again, these things, there was chip shortages and these things were poorly made and cheaply made to begin with. And basically the, the workmanship isn't up to the, scrap, to, up to the way it should be. And there are certain cartridges out there um, that once you put it in your console it just and, and switch it on, it just kills it. It kills the console dead. It sends it some sort of dodgy voltage or something goes straight through the chipset and kills the console dead. So if you ever hear the term killer cartridge and think, oh well that's just a silly rumour. No, this console had them. The the GX four thousand actually had killer cartridges. And there's no there's no telling which ones they are. There there are there are reports of uh versions of Robocop 2 uh, I think it's right, it's Robocop or Robocop 2 and I mean honestly if you if you go online and you check online forums and actually search for the terms the, there's you know three or four people saying this you know I've had a cartridge that has killed this console and bearing in mind the amount of people that even own this console three or four people is actually quite a lot you know, as as maybe like one percent of the people that currently own one of these consoles, um, but yeah, um, the only other time I've ever heard it's ever been proven that these killer cartridges actually exist is um, this isn't gonna this isn't gonna be anything to any anyone in Europe, but certainly in, if you are in the U.S. and you had one of the original PlayStation One Game Shark cartridges you know exactly what this means because they did the same thing the original run of the game shark cartridges you know the ones that plugged into the parallel port on the first playstation ones um could actually brick the console and in a lot of cases did and i think there was probably you know it was a couple of hundred people that had their brand new playstation ones just absolutely bricked because they plugged in one of these game sharks and that's the only other time this has actually been confirmed um, is basically the game shark for the PlayStation 1 that was released in North America you, you needed to have the original model PlayStation 1 and the first uh, production run of the North American game shark cartridge something would go wrong it would break the console and this is the same thing. The something goes wrong in the cartridge, absolutely bricks the console. Now this is unfortunate for collectors as well because if you spend, all right, you, you're probably not going to spend unless you're stupid. You're not going to spend a lot of money on the console. Um, but what if you spend a lot of money on one game and it turns out one this this one game you've bought, maybe you bought it sealed. I don't know. I mean, but. What if it turns out this one game that you've bought, you, you get round to trying it one day and it bricks your console? You know, what? Well, it's just, oh, unbelievable. You, you'd, be, you'd be heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken, wouldn't you? I mean, that's, that's what it would be. Um, 
So like I've said, these games are hard to find. The other problem we're collecting for this console is because the games are so hard to find, they are considered super rare. Um, I mean, how many? there are no lists available on how many copies of each game there are, because this console is so niche, there are, no, there are literally no accurate lists available, that they don't exist. Um, what does exist is because these are rare, these are considered rare and expensive, there are bootlegs, believe it or not. People are making bootleg cartridges for this console. Um, because by and large, even collectors uh, of this console uh, and its games do not necessarily know what they're looking for. I mean, yeah, they, they know roughly, but if they've never... Because these things are so rare, you might never see two of the one game in a lifetime. So there are bootlegs of these cartridges, so again, be wary. You might not even be buying something genuine. And I have seen, I mean, I've seen on eBay, and I haven't, I haven't really been looking, I've seen bootlegs um, of, of some of the some of the bigger titles. I think Robocop is one I've seen a bootleg of. Definitely Clax. Uh, you know, the old Atari game with the things tumbling down. I've seen, I've definitely seen bootlegs of Clax on eBay. Um, for some reason, that seems to be a popular one. Maybe, maybe it's easy to bootleg, I don't know, maybe. Um... So yeah, I mean the last thing I the last thing I'll add is uh, just before I give the verdict on this console, and I think you know what it's going to be, is that in preparation for this video, I'm not I'm not going to mention any names, but I did have a look online and I did go through a bit of YouTube um, to see. I mean, because as we all know, there are people that collect for these things and. If they're on YouTube, they're going to put up collection videos of, of what they do and, and what they think. And there were at least two people that had reasonably sized collections uh, for this console. And again, I'm not going to mention any names, but almost, in fact, they almost said the same thing, each of them. And that was... It's a great collector's piece. And that, to me, is alarm bells. I mean, when even a collector says, it's a great collector's piece, not it's great to collect for, but it is a great collector's piece, um, then what you've done there is you've basically collected a trophy collection. That, that's what you've done. To say, I have this niche console that nobody else has. Um, which is lovely. I mean, if you're into that and you want you want the niche console that nobody has, um, to my mind, you could probably do better getting a, uh, a re-released Japanese Master System when they re-released it as the Master System rather than the Mark III, because um, there are far less of them about than there were these produced. So, you know, if you do want that niche console, then that's the one that I would advise going for, because that's going to have all the benefits of actually being a half-decent console with a half-decent library of games. To call something a collector's piece, uh, uh, that's what you've done there, basically, is you've bought the world's most rubbish trophy. You know, um... So yeah, I mean, with, with all these things that I've mentioned in this video, it's very clear where I'm going to say with this. I would say avoid. Avoid this console, avoid its games. Um, even if you do manage to find the stuff you're looking for, there's no guarantee that any of it's going to work, um, because these things are so unreliable, it's unbelievable. And there's no guarantee it's the genuine article when it comes to the cartridges. And there's such little information about um, about each singular game that even to know if it if you know if there was any extras packed in with it, which is unlikely considering the state of the cartridge boxes and how everything was built to a price. But you're you're not even going to be sure if everything comes included. If you see what I mean, um, I would say avoid avoid this system definitely. Nobody needs anything like this in their lives, um, especially if you're collecting for multiple systems, 
this is always going to be your uh, not not Achilles. This is this is going to be your red-headed stepchild. You know, you want to love it, but nah, you know, um, it's going to get the blame of starting the house fires. So yeah, just avoid, avoid, avoid if you can. If you really, really, really want to collect it, there are um, ridiculous obsessive people that do collect for this system. And if if that's what floats their boat, then yeah, fine. I mean, but this video is really aimed at people that don't know about this system. And quite frankly, you would have been better off not knowing about this system and not watching any of this video. If you're seriously thinking of collecting for this system, then I would argue that instead of spending the money and time that it would take to find any of these cartridges, then you might be better off spending your money on some sort of professional mental help. Um, so yeah, but if you did want to just buy the console and stick it on a shelf, then I can't honestly blame you because it is um, a reasonable rarity. I think that's about it. That's all I'm going to mention on this. Uh, I don't think I've missed anything out. Like I say, this uh, the reason why it took so long to do this video is because information is so sketchy and nothing, it took ages to confirm everything I've said. I mean, like I say, I, I mean, I knew a little bit about this con, so I had actually heard of it before. And in fact, I do vaguely remember them being on sale in, uh, in Dixon's and, and places like that, but um, Woolies, I think, had quite a prominent shop front for them. But anyway, um, yeah, it, it did take quite a lot of effort to research just this small amount that's in this video. So, yeah, I think that's about that. So, next video, I'm going to be moving on to the fourth generation. And this is where things start to go a bit mad. Um, not with so many different companies entering the market, but lots of companies... Um, at least one company with, that I can think off the top of my head that just kept releasing stuff over and over again. Um, it's. I'm not saying that the Generation 4 videos are going to be long, uh, but some of them might have to be split. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I haven't really worked out what I'm going to do yet and how I'm going to um, structure everything, but this is going to be the last video of Generation 3. Oh, excuse me. I know there are some, uh, there are obviously going to be consoles that I didn't cover, and the basic reason that I wasn't going to cover this one, to be perfectly honest with you, but I thought, well, there's not that many, uh, I mean, most of the people on YouTube that, that do these sorts of videos, they're, they're all from the US, and I don't expect anyone doing these sorts of videos from the US to have even, this console wouldn't even have been on their radar, let alone would they actually know anything about it. Uh, they prob Most people in the US wouldn't even realise that this console existed, um, because like I say, even the information, and I knew what I was looking for, I found the information sketchy to get at best. Um, so that, that's the whole reason why I've done this video, is because it was a British console, it was only really released here, and in France, uh, allegedly, and um, I thought, well, if I don't do it, nobody will do it, and then some poor arsehole's going to come across one of these at a boot sale one day, and go, oh, what's that, i better buy one and put it in with my collection, and then lose their mind trying to find any games that work for it. Um, so yeah, that's basically why this video exists, is purely because nobody else was going to do one. Um, or certainly anyone else that was going to do one was likely going to be one of these disturbed, obsessive collectors um, that probably would have given you, would have given you certainly a more positive view than mine on the console. Um, and arguably maybe I've got a bit of a negative spin on things. Um, there's there's no need to put a positive spin on this console as far as I'm concerned. Um, there's one or two features that were good but were never really utilised at all. So anyway, enough. Enough about Amstrad, enough about the GX4000. 
Um, and the next video will be moving on to generation four. Uh, so yeah, once I've figured out what I'm going to do, I, how I'm going to structure those videos, then I will definitely be start making a start on that. I hope everyone's enjoyed this uh, this trip down niche lane. And if anyone is one of these mental cases that collects for this, then it would be nice to hear from you. I think you know as as you know as as long as you keep it civil um because quite frankly you're the only ones that are going to know if i've missed anything out or if you do think i've been too unfair um because anyone else who watches this isn't going to have heard of it uh so yeah i i know i'm i'm starting to say this every video and i'm starting to repeat myself the you know f feel free to use the comment section provided you keep it civil and keep it clean because um, bearing in mind this is not a mature rated video so anyone can watch this so um, the way I would always advise people to put the comments is that imagine that your five-year-old nephew was reading what you were typing and knew that was you that was typing it um, write it like that um, and, and you won't go far wrong yeah, because bearing in mind, I mean, even though this is this, none of my videos are mature rated. Um, it hasn't happened to me yet, thankfully. But I have seen other stuff, and I've I've seen comments on people's videos that is about, you know, it, it's like a Minecraft video or something like that. That clearly loads of kids are going to be watched, and there's just the comment section is just obscene. You think honestly, what is going on? But yeah. Do pull me up in the comments if you do think I've got anything wrong. And um, that's about it. I will see you hopefully in the next video, uh, which is going to be Generation 4, but I haven't decided which console basically I'm going to do first. So it'll be a nice surprise for both of us when I finally get around to doing it. So, uh, yeah, goodbye.